Welcome to Mission Evolution Radio Show with Gwilda Wiaka, bringing together today's leading experts to uncover ever-deepening spiritual truths and the latest scientific developments in support of the evolution of humankind. For more information on Mission Evolution Radio with Gwilda Wiaka, visit www.missionevolution.org. And now, here's the host of Mission Evolution, Miss Gwilda Wiaka. Meditation has long been proven to have many life-changing benefits. What are those benefits? Can an average person learn to meditate in a reasonable amount of time? Mission Evolution Radio TV show is coming to you on the Exxon TV, exxontvchannel.com, and Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. We're produced by Relmar McConnell Media Company with corporate offices and uh, studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. With us this hour to explore the many benefits of meditation and a quick way to achieve them is Richard Dixie, Ph.D., Richard is the author of Three Minutes a Day, a 14-week course to learn meditation and transform your life, and a senior faculty member at the Dharma College in Berkeley, California. A research scientist and lifelong student of Buddhism, he holds advanced degrees in biophysics and the history and philosophy of science. Dixie directed Bioelectronic Research Unit in London Hospital before becoming CEO of his own biotech company. He moved to the U.S. to devote himself to teaching meditation, deepening his own practice, and running the Light of Buddha Dharma Foundation in India. His website, richarddixie.com. Richard, thanks for joining us on Mission Evolution. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so we, where did meditation originate? Let's just start with the, at the, at the ground zero. Where did, where did it come from? Well, it's an ancient Indian tradition. Um, it predates the Buddha, who's normally associated with meditation. Oh, interesting. But in fact, he, was, he was taught meditation by two teachers. He developed it further than they did, and that's what caused his enlightenment. But the actual tradition, particularly the tradition of calmness meditation, predates him and goes back really as far as we can tell to 1000 BC, maybe even earlier. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the the practice of it, um, so you've said how old it is. How do you think it, or do we have any idea how and why it came to be? Yeah, I, I think really from the time human beings began to look at their experience as experience, and this is true in both the European Greek culture and also in ancient India, they began to realize there were elements of it that needed training. And really meditation is about is about looking at your experience as experience and then going, wow, are there things here I could improve? Are there things I could do? And this basic understanding is what lies behind the so-called Dharma traditions of Asia, which is to say are really ancient. And what's amazing about them is they're unbroken. So we have meditation lineages that literally go back 3000 years. And they're unbroken, unlike all of our Western uh, traditions are all broken by the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. These are not. And so we can have access to really interesting insights. And I think these insights arose when human beings were first examining their world. And so you see in the Greeks, Socrates and the pre-Socratic philosophers and all that. And in India, you see the Buddha and the great meditators. And really, the tradition just developed from there in India and really was developed extraordinarily deeply in the medieval period. And we have access to all of this through the Asian and Himalayan traditions. Another ancient form, of course, is shamanism, and they use journey work Mm -hmm. rather than, you know, or or a trance-like state rather than a meditative state. Could you please tell us the difference between meditation and trance? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously I'm not a shaman, so I can only speak partially to this. We are living in a map. This is a fundamental position. We're living in a model of the world. We're not living in the world. I mean, basic physiology tells you that our five senses make images of what's around us. They don't see what's around us like a camera. They make images of what's around us. And that map making is fundamental to our experience. Now, what that says is that the actuality 
of our experience, which is beyond the map, may be quite different from what the map shows us. Just like if I have a map of a countryside, I get, you know, where the roads are and where the buildings are, but I don't see the buildings, I don't see the roads. I see a map of the buildings and the roads. And in exactly the same way, I think that's true of our experience. And what happens in shamanism is you break free of the map, normally using hallucinogenic substances, which suppress map making, they suppress that functionality of map making, and then begin to explore. Now, what the shaman is doing then is of intense interest. Now, to a Buddhist, a Buddhist would say, ultimately, all the quote, beings that you meet are still part of a bigger map. Ultimately, you need to understand that as well. Now, if shamans do that, that's great. Then really they are, in a way, meditating. But, of course, the problem is if you use psychedelic agents to do this, they have lingering effects. It would be much better. No one could possibly deny it. It would be much better if you could access those states without chemical intervention. Then you would have the clarity of your own normal state, but in a bigger world. And that's really what meditation is about. And I think that's one difference. But, you know, I don't want to get too stuck into this because I'm not a shaman. So I can only speak a little bit. Oh, my God. I can only speak a little bit about uh, what shamanism does. So, yeah, I need to be a little careful not to make critical comments about a tradition I don't really know. <laughs> I understand. So what part of the... Um the brain does meditation use does do the brain waves change what happens there actually it's interesting we're doing research on this at the moment there are many many different types of meditation I mean, one has to say that from the outset this is a culture it's not like one thing there are many many different types and uh, one of the most striking types of meditation is trance meditation so-called jhana meditation which is a, a a tradition that's practiced was it practiced extensively in ancient india and is still practiced in burma and we've been looking at trance meditators and they do indeed show remarkable brain changes really big um and one of the things that happens is the the so-called default mode network which is the network that creates a model of the world this map maker gets dissociated gets shut down and what then happens is different brain regions begin to freewheel in a very, very interesting way. Now, what does this tell us? Well, not much, actually. Really, I mean, we do it because we think it's important to show that meditation works, but actually meditation is about you and your experience. No scientist can tell you anything about you and your experience. This is a fundamental thing one needs to understand. The, the claim that we're going to, quote, understand our own experience through third person means is obviously nonsensical because we only have our own first person experience, which means we need to work ourselves to understand our experience. And that's really what meditation is about. And of course, modern education, with its stress on the, quote, external world and on the truth that's found by science, totally misses this fundamental truth that we only ever and only can ever experience our five senses, where is it? our five senses and our thoughts and emotions. We don't have any other avenues of experience. We need to understand them. And if we do, we will make huge discoveries about what we are, who we are, what our place in the world is, and many of the evils that modern culture creates in terms of its technological advances and the stress levels and all the other alienation and all the things that are happening can be tracked back to this fundamental change in attitude. If that change happens, many of the problems of modernity go away. And so that's one of the reasons why I feel so passionately about meditation, even though I am a thoroughly trained scientist you know, degree in Oxford, degree in London University, ran my own laboratories, ran a pharmaceutical company. I mean, I really do know a bit about science. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, you and your experience is entirely your business. And all the scientists can tell you is ab about it. They can't actually address it. And that's the thing that meditation offers. 
Also, if um, you know science goes for the facts and and you know gets the facts and figures and this and that, but we still have to experience it and interpret it according to our perceptions, right? Well, yes, and indeed, even facts and figures, we need to be very careful about what we're talking about there, because you do tend to get what you look for. And if you know, if all you have is a hammer, all you see is nails. And the truth is that science is very like that. And any decent scientist will tell you this, that they're 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 exploring avenues that open to them because of the techniques they have. They're not necessarily the only avenues that exist. It's just the ones they have. So one needs to be really careful of using the word truth in the same sentence as science. Science is giving us a model, another model of the, quote, world. The problem is the model that science gives us of the world is of a world we cannot experience. It's entirely in the third person. And this is very problematic. And of course, now as very sophisticated technology is emerging that can manipulate our perceptions in a sophisticated manner, particularly mobile phone driven advertising, now artificial intelligence, we're seeing massive alienation. And this is because there is not a basic understanding of our own experience. And without that basic understanding, modern technology is destructive and is destructive of people's well-being. They may be more efficient, but they're not going to be happier. And indeed, the happiness index has not improved, even though people's economic circumstances have improved, their health comes, outcomes have improved, the amount of material and possessions they have have increased. All these metrics have got better, but for one, happiness. And that's because until you understand your own perception, how can you possibly make access to happiness in a lasting manner? You'll have fleeting moments of happiness, of course, but there's something fundamental about how we map the world that needs to be understood. And if we can understand that, we can make a better life for ourselves, ourselves, which is really the only people who are ever going to. And yet technology and our educational system and everything else has us looking outside of ourselves That's for right. the answers. Um, and I know that we're about out of time in, the, in this segment, but when we come back, I'd like to talk about the increase in teen suicide. I mean, it is epidemic proportions, uh, right. apparently, and, and, and adult suicide for that matter. How does, how does that relate to what we're looking at here and how we've lost touch with what's in here versus what's out there? Richard and I will return shortly, so don't go away. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Can the ancient practice of meditation help with today's complex challenges? With us this hour discussing the benefits of meditation is Richard Dixie, the author of Three Minutes a Day, 14-week course to learn meditation and transform your life. Richard, we were talking about um, how suicide and and um, disassociation and, and disconnection um, has started to run rampant um, in our society. And how does that relate to uh, the lack of meditation or how can meditation help that? Well, to address this question, we need to get basically to this mapping business we were talking about a moment ago. Now, we have a very interesting word in our common language. We say we recognize when I meet someone I know, I recognize them. I cognize them, then I recognize them. Okay. There is an understanding in the common language, there is some reflexivity that happens in knowing something. Now, you can actually measure this, and it takes about 400 milliseconds, click, click, for a recognition to occur in time. That means that when you look around the room where you are sitting and you recognize everything it is, you are about click, click behind the actuality of that room at all times, which means we are significantly behind, quote, reality at all times. Now, in fact, there's an amazing uh, video on the Internet of this guy who's nearly hit by lightning. And he's walking across a, a sort of, you know, rainy quadrangle or something in, in the southern states of America. And, and there's a lightning strike and he struggles and picks up his umbrella and runs on. When you slow the film down, he's walking at about two steps a second. The lightning strike ha happens, wipes out the screen. He takes another whole step before reacting. 
he is half a second behind reality. We all are. Now, what happens in that half a second? Well, recognition happens in that half a second. Recognition is map making. Now, here we have a very interesting thing. How do we recognize? We recognize because we knew it before. In fact, what advertisers are always trying to do is to program us. So when we see an object they have spent a lot of money putting into our heads, we recognize that object and associate it with either wanting it or buying it or whatever it is they're trying to sell us. Now, this process is almost automatic. Unless we understand it, unless we get behind recognition, we will feel our agency being taken from us by sophisticated techniques like this. Now, with the advent of mobile phones, and particularly with the advent of large data, the ability to manipulate people's awareness has got more and more and more sophisticated. And this is coupled, as we talked about earlier, with an educational system that says you as an individual don't matter. All that matters is the, quote, external world, whatever that might be, whatever we're going to tell you about it. Those two factors together lead to a profound sense of alienation. You're told you don't matter. And all the time you're being dragged this way and that by things that you didn't choose. Now, those two forces together are profoundly alienating. And indeed, people land up going, my life has no meaning. My life has no value. I am nothing. I don't matter. And the next thing that can happen in such a circumstance, and this is also recognitive, is that ideas about ending it all and suicide and romantic ideas, you know, samurais and all that, all this romantic ideas of ending it all become extremely pervasive and persuasive. And sometimes people take action. That's the fundamental root cause of this whole problem. Now, we need to allow people to take ownership of their experience. Now, this is not flat earth talking. Of course, there are people who say, I have the right to believe whatever I like. You know, it's my free will, all this nonsense. That is not what we are talking about here. We're talking about getting a grip on our attention. The proper word is adverting. Our attention is being adverted left and right by advertisements. And so we, if, let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let me back up a little bit so we're on the same page here. So yeah. is because uh, electronics and, and um, artificial intelligence uh, can move very, very quickly, is it sliding in that little place where we recogn uh, recognize things? Yes, of course. If, if, if. I have a computer that can track everything you bought. I can then tailor an advert to trigger your recognitive mechanism to want something. And that's exactly how personalized advertising works. It is designed to capture, to, to actually capture advert, make, make you advert. And the problem is that making leads to a sense of loss of control. And, you know, kids now live on their phones and they live in this virtual world, which is, quote, free because it is being paid for by advertisers who are precisely trying to do that. So people land up in an extreme form of living other. Now, Really, humanity has always known that we live other. If you read autobiographies, often people will say, you know, I've lived this long life, but somehow I was never me. That's because even in society, the same thing is happening. All that's happened is modern technology has taken that basic sense of alienation and perfected it into a perfect marketing model. But the effects on people are to have profound self-alienation, lack of self-worth and with no self-worth and no feeling of any value it's not surprising that unfortunate things then happen exactly. and this is why meditation is so urgently needed because and that's my next question is how does meditation um uh short stop that how does that work okay so there's another way you could express this 
We're all vi victims of reflexive reactivity. So something comes along that annoys me and immediately I react, right? That's because I have recognized whatever that thing is. And in that recognition, all these angry associations have been triggered. And so I immediately trigger into reactivity. That's reflex reactivity. Now, reflexive reactivity is the root mechanism behind why we get so stressed all the time. Now, in fact, it had profound value to Homo sapiens. We don't have many physical attributes to suit us for life in the wild. <laughs> Quite honestly, when we were coming out of the savannah, there were saber toothed tigers and sloth bears and all kinds of terrifying animals who easily kill us. We had to learn from experience. That means our ability to learn is part of our recognitive mechanism. In fact, being reflexively reactive can help you survive when you see pointy ears in the bushes and immediately run. You don't go, what's that? Is that interesting? You know it's a saber tooth tiger. You better get out of there. So we are inherently paranoid and our learning mechanism is paranoid. It's designed to protect us. The trouble is we now live in a technological world which has evolved in the last 200 years. I mean, it's not as if it evolved thousands of years ago. In the last 200 years, with the same reflexive paranoia at its root. So as a result, as technology gets better and better and better, our paranoia is going up because there's all this new stuff. And now we have politician after politician fantasizing about the good old days, great again, whenever it was, you know, we've got to go back to some golden age where everything was fine. This is all a reflection of the increasing alienation we're suffering from as economic, social, technological, and environmental phenomena all going to change at the same time. <laughs> this reactive mechanism is going nuts. And of so, course, so let's if, it. if we go into our reactive, not if, but when we go into our reactive mechanism, are we indeed kind of jumping into a different reality, a past reality versus exactly what's going on right now? We're jumping into a map. Mm -hmm. And that's I mean, our past reality. We build that on our past experience. What, one thing that Pete, and I'll get on to meditation in a second, but just one more thing to say. A lot of people associate meditation with consciousness, you know, universal consciousness, all this sort of talk. It's utterly ridiculous. If you learn to drive a car, you start off very conscious of your fingers on the wheel and wh where the buttons are and everything. When you learn to drive a car, it becomes unconscious. That's to say learning things makes you less conscious of them, not more conscious of them. It's absolutely the reverse of what you would expect. And that's because what you're doing is you're incorporating that learned skill into a map. So your map then includes how to drive. And your map includes how to play the violin or whatever your map happens to be. Now, if you are unconscious of that map making, you are in many ways living in a model of your own life, not in your own life. You're in a model of it. Now, that's fine as long as nothing changes and everything's hunky dory. When change comes along, your model doesn't work anymore. Then there's like, my gosh, what am I going to do? I, I can't make sense of my environment. That's the stress. And of course, every year that goes past, there are massive changes happening. So people's models are being stressed because they no longer know how to live. And as I say, there's this great, I, you know, sort of romantic idea about some past utopia that we're now losing. This is such a common element of political discourse, totally based on a misunderstanding of our own cognition. Now, what does meditation do? Meditation. Part one, understand your own attention. You have to understand how attention works. If you don't understand it, your reflexive reactivity is going to pull you this way and that way because that's how it works in reality. So how is attention trained? This is the first step in meditation. Now, this is where there is an enormous, an enormous an incredibly helpful key from the ancient culture. Attention has two parts, not one. Now, all of us have been pay, uh, trained to pay attention. It is a feature of contemporary education. Pay attention, 
pay attention, look at what you're doing, concentrate, pay attention. This kind of attentiveness is called, it's brittle. It's, it's, a, it's the ability to focus on one thing to the exclusion of everything else. It's brittle. In the ancient culture, it's called vitaka. Now, this brittle ability to hold attention is fine, but the moment something comes along that grabs your attention, it's broken. So people say, oh, I, you know, I, I can I try to meditate, but then someone slammed a car door and I had to stop. And, you know, thoughts come and they bug me. and I can't you know, I have to kind of shut everything down. But there is another element of meditation. That well, is we're, med we're going to have to pick up on that element okay. of meditation on the other side of a, of a quick station break. Um, <laughs> no problem. Richard and I will be back to continue our discussion. So please stay right there. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Can meditation transform your life? This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. With us discussing the many facets of a meditation practice is Richard Dixie. His website, richarddixie.com. Richard, so far, we've looked at how um, our brain works in that there's this little gap between when we when an incident happens and when we perceive it or map it out. And it's that little gap that all of the media is getting into to redirect our wants, needs, desires. And then we're also talking about how it is demanding our attention and eroding our situational awareness and our sense of ourselves in the world or within ourselves. So how can meditation shift that? So that very precise summary. Thank you. So I've been <laughs> talking about Vitaka which is the ability to place your meditate your uh, your concentration on an object but it's brittle and um, most people think that's what meditation is you look at an object and you try to keep your attention on it for as long as possible but unfortunately if you just think that's what meditation is you fail because a car door slams someone talks to someone drill starts whatever you're immediately broken life but happens if, right life happens <laughs> but there's a second element to meditation that's incredibly important here. It's called vikara. Now, vikara is the ability to savor an object. Now, savoring is also concentration. That's to say, if, if you're going to savor something, you have to have it in your mind or you can't savor it, right? So literally, vitaka, the ability to advert your attention, is like picking up a cup of coffee and putting it to your lips. Vikara is tasting the coffee. Now, if there is one thing that is characteristic of modernity, it is that we no longer taste the coffee. We're so busy going from one thing to another. We gulp our food. We consume experience relentlessly because our vitaka is overstimulated by advertising and our vikara is undeveloped. So the first step and the vital step in becoming non-reactive, that's to say you still have events happening, but you're no longer reflexively reacting to them. You have found what is called your center is to develop vikara. Now vikara is normally developed by concentrating on a changing object. If an object changes, you can no longer advert to it because it's changing. You have to move with it. And that moving with it, like it's like dancing or something. You're dancing with the object. I like to use the sound of a fading bell. So you take the ear gate, which is one of our five senses, you listen to the bell as you hit it. And then as the bell fades, you follow the fading sound. And what happens in the end when you get good at this is you'll find yourself listening to nothing. You have become so, concentrated without an object. Now, this is a fundamental ground zero of successful meditation. So when we think about our young our young folk, OK, the up and coming generation, they grew up in this electronic age. And do you think that I mean, you watch one of them on a computer, it's like, whoa, they can be so fast, you know, with their games and their this. And that. But is that because they don't know they don't they never learn to savor and they just have to keep speeding up the stimulus in order to fulfill themselves? Uh, you know, I come from a you know, my kids are now 20 and 21. And we bought our first iPhone when it first came out in 2008. You got to rent the iPhone and he came out in 2008. We bought in Hong Kong. 
And I remember the first iPhone and the kids getting iPhones really soon after that, because we didn't really realize quite what was going to happen. And they've they've grown up with iPhones. I mean, they, they were five and six, I think, when we got them. And they've had iPhones ever since. And they have literally grown up on the screen. What's interesting now is I think some of these kids are getting the hang of this. They're realizing that the phone isn't everything. There is definitely a reaction to social media in particular, which is the worst kind of mirror that just mirrors reflexive reactivity back to you. And so I think the kids are beginning to get on top of it. But generally, if you look at modernity and you look at social and economic circumstances, it is quite clear that this is a huge issue. And we need to basically develop techniques to deal with it. Now, the wonderful thing is they already exist. The ancient meditation techniques are precisely designed to address this issue. And if you can go from Vitaka to Vikara, the benefit is immediate. Immediately, your stress level falls. Immediately, you're able to go, no, I don't want that. I don't have to reflexively go towards something. I can appreciate it and say, do I want it or not? Your agency is returned to you. Does it bring you more into the present moment versus that delayed uh, reaction place? Well, okay. So what do we even mean by the present moment? There's a very interesting question, isn't it? Because well, well, you mentioned that that we aren't present because it's there's that quick snap, right? right? Yeah. But of course, when you start going the present, it leads to a great enigma, which is enormously interesting and explorable in meditation. What is time? What are we actually talking about when we say the present moment? Do we mean the femtosecond, the attosecond? I don't know, the Planck interval. What is the present moment actually? And the only way you're ever going to address that is in your own experience. Okay, a physicist can tell you what the present moment is, but that's not actually your present moment. That's a metric that's being used in a technological device. What is your present moment? Now, this is where time gets very interesting because you realize that time, as in past, present and future, is part of the map. It's not part of actuality. There, we all have many experiences where time stops. That's because suddenly we have an experience that's beyond our mapping. We may be in awe or surprise or shock at many places where time stops. But what we actually mean by that is experience as experience starts. Experience starts when time stops. Time is part of the map. It's not part of our actuality. And again, that's the breakthrough that begins to happen to meditators. They find access to, you could say, the eternal present, to some time less engagement with actuality that is not mapped recognitively by what they already know. So as a result, people become more creative. They make better choices. They become kinder. They become surprising because you can no longer really predict what they're going to do next. They don't know what they're going to do next. They're not in a map. They're not, are, they're not fulfilling an obligation to a map. Are, the, are these maps starting to break down presently? It, se it seems like uh, everything's up in the air. Everything's moving yeah, really quickly I, and everybody's off balance. Um, is it the maps are failing us at this point? Yes, the maps are failing. And the maps are failing because the maps are essentially reactive and based in the past. And as long as the present is accelerating in its change, the past no longer ma accurately maps it. So people feel a gnawing sense of paranoia. Now, as I said, the, 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 the map is paranoid. So the only news that we read is bad news. I am more interested in an earthquake in Alaska than I am in some nice person helping someone across the road outside my window. Why is that? What's written now? People say, oh, I blame the media. The media are manipulating. Not anything to do with the media. It's because the map is paranoid. And all the map is going is, do I need to change anything because there was an earthquake in Alaska? So I read the article. Now, of course, as a result, all of our news feeds, which again, coming at us day and night, are bad news. We are literally bombarded with bad news. 
But if you were to do a statistical survey, you would find the good news outnumbers the bad news magnitudes to one. It's just nobody reports it. Nobody reports people helping each other across the road. That nobody reports the fact that when there's an accident, complete strangers stop their car and run to help people out. Nobody, nobody reports the good news because we're not interested in good news. We're only interested in bad news. And this does that have to do with the paranoia? Yes, it's paranoid. That it's that uh, preoccupation with the bad news is because of the paranoia. Yes, of course, okay. because the, the recognitive, reflexive, recognitive mechanism evolved in Homo sapiens to save us from predatory animals and difficult situations because we're not covered with fur. We don't have big fangs. We're not able to defend ourselves. We have to be clever. So it is that mechanism that has taken us from the savannas to driving around in cars. It is that very same mechanism. So I'm not saying it's an enemy. It needs to be understood. Once it's understood, it becomes an extraordinary friend because everything you've learned, all your experiences become your servant once you cease to reflexively react to them. But as long so you're, as you're reflexively reacting to them, they're like a prison holding you in. So we're basically taking the events of the past, superimposing them on the present and making a rerun out of the future when we're in this reactive state. That's called past, present and future. And that's why <laughs> philosophers from time immemorial have talked about the eternal return. The fact that things go in circles. People always say history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Why does it rhyme? It rhymes because of this. We are literally repeating you can study history and see today. You can see exactly the pressures today that happened many times in the past. Have we changed? No, we haven't. Because until we understand this, we cannot change. So you can read the meditations of Marcus Aurelius. I'm sure you've read them and hear a modern voice, even though that guy was writing in 150 AD. But you hear modernity. You think, wow, that I could have talked to this guy yesterday. What's that saying? It's saying, wow, there's something in our cognition we're not getting to grips with. Now, no matter how many brain scientists you have telling you, oh, it's the default mode network, that doesn't do anything to your own reflexive reactivity. You have to train it. It's your job as a human being. And honestly, they should teach meditation in primary school. It should be reading, writing and meditation. If they taught reading, writing and meditation, we would have a better world and we wouldn't have the bigotry and stupidity that well-educated people often display simply because they don't understand their own perception. What, what the Asians would say is they're fundamentally ignorant. They may be very, very knowledgeable, but they're fundamentally ignorant of this profound truth. So we're basically um, operating out of false perceptions perceptions uh, that are we're old and cemented. Perceptions. Now, yes, to say that's what false, I meant. Yeah, I mean, this is where it gets very careful. Sometimes the map is great. For example, when you learn how to drive, you can you will reactively stop the car when someone runs in front of it. It'll happen before you even know it's happened. The map's really great. It can do things very, very well. It's a tool. But it's but not don't let busy. it run you. <laughs> well, you can see his nails, you know, it's like that. <laughs> It's yeah. a tool. It's a very amazing tool. A six channel parallel processor. I mean, if we well, had an instruction manual, it would say this is a six channel parallel processor. Be careful how you use it. <laughs> all these warning signs all across. <laughs> it. Yes. Well, it is time for yet another station break. Okay, cool. Please stay with us. As Richard and I continue to explore the evolutionary aspects of modern practice of meditation. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Can meditation make you more creative or intelligent? This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. We're continuing our discussion with Richard Dixie. His website, richarddixie.com. So Richard, can meditation and, and, and starting to find the control knob on our little gaps that advertising is slipping into, can, can that free us up to be more intelligent or more creative? Yes, it can. You know, the other thing I want to say, although these traditions come from ancient culture, there is 
one significant improvement we can make. Because in our modern technological culture, we have a good understanding of the mechanisms of cognition from a scientific perspective, we can be very clear about the reasons for meditation. Now, meditation traditions were originally developed by monks. And obviously, they meditated for hours. It was their day job. And so we don't actually have to meditate for hours to get these benefits. Once we get that, get our head around this recognition thing and realize, OK, there really is a recognitive process. We can focus our meditation very precisely on key elements in our perceptual field and develop insights very quickly. This means we can develop meditation practice in the time it takes to drink a cup of coffee, basically. Obviously, at the end of a course of doing this, you will have an understanding of what meditation offers. And if you want to go on and meditate eight hours, great, why not? But it's quite possible to get the basic insight that meditation offers in a very, very short period of time and then use that during your working day. And I feel quite passionately this is important for modernity to understand because, you know, we all work. There's no real chance that we're going to drop out and become monks. So what we need to do is to find meditation practices that work within our normal life. And that's what informed this book that I wrote. I'm trying to find ways because, you know, as a cognitive, as, as a scientist who worked in cognition and worked looking at brain function, I thought it was very interesting that we can see a parallelism emerging between the meditation traditions taken from the subjective pole and scientific cognitive psychology taken from the objective pole. And we can now use those insights and guide our meditations. So it's possible to develop these practices very easily. And if we do develop them, we find all kinds of benefits because our reflexivity limits our choices. Now we all know as we get older, we get, quote, wiser. What that means is when we know something works, we know it works because we've done it a hundred times, but we get more and more rigid because we know what works and we don't want to look at anything else. Those two things go together. That rigidity is because the map making has enclosed us into a way of living that's worked for us and we're not going to change. In conservatism, it's called it politically. And the problem is that kind of rigidity, whilst it is great for solving the problems that come up again and again, it is not great in dealing with change. And so much creativity is where something novel arises and a novel response is given to it. Not yesterday's response going, what is that? But a novel response and that novelty is something that meditation develops and so you land up with people who start off meditating and they find they want to go paint or become a poet or whatever they just have the freedom to do whatever they wish it's called knowledge ability you have the ability to develop knowledge and when you actually read the biographies of great thinkers like einstein or hawking or these people they're like children really they're asking really simple questions but they have the freedom to ask those questions. It's not genius level. And, and get different and get questions. different answers than okay. what our, our candid answers would be. It makes They're sense, you know. That, That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. It it makes sense given, you know, you think about uh, some of the, the words of the great masters, be be ye as little children. Okay. Yeah. Isn't that what this is talking about? Is <laughs> embrace every experience outside of the map. Yes. And Zen mind, beginner's mind, have a beginner's mind. But we need to develop this faculty. That means we do need a practice, particularly to develop Vikara. Vikara is the most important key to the whole thing. Once and again, we for, Vikara, for our audience, Vikara is the, the ability to save or to really experience something yeah, versus so just see it. There's a really nice metaphor, actually. Um, if you have a glass of water with a bit of dust in it and you shake it up because you're always turbulent, you're always reacting to everything, so you're doing this the whole time, the water will be turbulent and it can be full of dust and you won't be able to see clearly. The first step is to overcome reflexive reactivity. And it's a bit like putting that, that glass of water on a shelf and gradually the dust settles and the water becomes clear. Now, clarity is called pasana in, 
in the ancient language. And V Pasada is to see clearly, to discriminate clearly. And it is the fruit of being less reactive. You see clearly, actually, our wisdom is innate. We don't have to be taught insight. We discover insight when we cease being reactive. It's our innate life. And that's why young children will be so perceptive because they're not being stirred up by a mental map because they haven't got one. They'll suddenly go, Daddy, why do you do that? <laughs> oh, my God. You know, and that's the, the ability of young children. They see clearly. Now, they may not know what they're seeing, but they see clearly. Now, this is a capacity of mind we all have. We can all develop it at any time in life. And through seeing clearly, we make better choices. We're not driven by the past. We're able to reassess our circumstance. We're able to choose more wisely. All kinds of benefits come from the simple ability to see clearly. And if you can't see clearly, you blunder around in circles, which unfortunately is how most of us live. Repeat. There's a lot of blundering going on, yes. <laughs> yeah, repeating the past, repeating the past, repeating the past. And this spinning in place is what in, in, in the ancient language is called samsara. It's literally spinning, spinning, spinning like this. We break it by developing vipassana. And suddenly we see clearly and we go, no, I don't have to do that anymore. I'm not obligated to do that. And that capacity is a direct fruit of meditation. I mean, direct. It's not it, not sort of some side effect. It is directly what meditation does. Well, it's the time in the show when I get to ask you, Richard, what's your mission? Oh, my mission is to teach meditation to as many people in contemporary conditions as I can. I'm not interested in turning people into Buddhists or anything like that. I'm not interested in changing people's religious beliefs. I just want them to understand their perception. And I feel it's... Uh, such a, a, a lack in modern education. There is nothing in our modern educational system that talks about our own perception. Yet every minute of every day, every second of that minute until we die is our perception. We literally learn about everything else but ourselves. And to me, that's like, wow, that is so crazy. And I just feel passionate to try to find ways to enable people easily, the time it takes to drink a cup of coffee, not, not, not a big deal, a little thing, but to get that bit of insight. And once you get that bit of insight, it's like the scales fall from your eyes and you suddenly realize why so many of the world's problems come back to this. Arguably, all the world problems come back to this. This is the fundamental problem we all suffer from. And technology is not going to change it. No matter how many weapons we make, phones we make, cars we make, we will not solve this problem. If anything, we will blow ourselves up. And so this is something really, really important. And, you know, I just felt when I retired from running my company, this is what I want to do. I want to find ways of opening this door. It's only a small door, but it opens into a new world, a world where you are no longer reflexively reacting, where you are seeing clearly what is happening around you and making good choices. And that to me is a gift of enormous magnitude, yet it is so simple. And the amazing thing is, it's there in these traditions. It's not like I have to make it up. I didn't invent any of this stuff. I'm not trying to be original with regard to it. All I'm trying to do is to take these traditions, take away from them any religious connotation, express them in modern language and present them to modernity and say, look, look at this. And that's my wish. If that, Here we if have I'm, a key. I'll be happy. That's, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a very, very worthwhile mission. Yeah. And I know there are some steps being taken to include meditation in schools and they're having amazing results. Yeah. So instead of going to the principal and being put in detention, they're sent to a quiet room and where everybody's meditating. Yeah. And it's just changed things amazingly. I had someone yeah. on the show that described yeah. that. It was just amazing. And of course, that, that type of mindfulness meditation is right on the border of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. With the understanding of mapping, mindfulness becomes a way of living. 
as long as you understand the mapping, the mapping is so important. Now, of course, the ancients didn't have this metaphor of mapping. That's something that's come from cognitive psychology, but it is incredibly apposite. And of course, we all realize we're making a map. Let's, we've got to stop confusing the map with the territory. The territory, which is what, which is quote, reality, whatever that might be, is not a map. And of course, that's where the shamanism and the UFOs and all the rest of it belongs. It belongs in the territory. We have to get out of the map. And this is a fundamental life skill. And yet modernity, the mapping is getting more and more intense because, of course, you make money in the map. You don't make money in the territory. You make money in the map. The rich guy is someone who finds something in the map and gets other people to buy it in the map and make them feel good in the map. And the problem with that is, as that gets more and more sophisticating, it becomes like this hellscape of, of commercialized map making, you know, epitomized by these awful goggles, which are like, OK, let's cut off from the world altogether and live in a world of advertising as if that represents a step forward for humanity. Well, but of course, economically, very attractive. <laughs> very attractive, very attractive. But money's in the map too. So, you know, yeah, what the heck? Right? <laughs> it's good, rich and poor in the map. And, you know, rich people are not necessarily happier people. They're just uh, rich no, people. They're, they're just rich people. Stuff. Well, unfortunately, Richard, we are out of time. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your very unusual perspective. My pleasure. Our guest this hour has been Richard Dixie, PhD, author of Three Minutes a Day, a 14-week course to learn meditation and transform your life. Richard is a senior faculty member at Dharma College in Berkeley, California, a research scientist and a lifelong student of Buddhism. To find out more about Richard, where you can get his book and all he has to offer, visit his website, richarddixie.com. This has been Mission Evolution with Gwilda Wiecka. For more information or to enjoy past archived episodes, visit www.missionevolution.org. But please, be sure to join us right here next time. This mission will continue, bringing information, resources, and support to our rapidly evolving world.